How are you guys doing? Today's episode is sponsored by Established Titles and Aura. I actually took a uh, last few days off, I guess you'd say. I worked on my other project, which is that other channel. And it was kind of nice. It was a lot of fun. I've been having a blast over there. I think we've, we're like 150 subscribers away from cracking 28,000 on that new channel. It's been around for like two weeks. I'm jacked about it. It's a lot of fun. It really has been a lot of fun. And people seem to really be enjoying it. Uh, you guys need to check it out if you guys have not already. It's just called Robert Turkle, which is my name, clearly. Robert, and then T-E-R-K-L-A. You type it, it'll pop right up. Uh, it'll, if you want to see what we do outside of talking about Ukraine, uh, we just posted a video actually going through this insanely large collection I've actually bought inside of Washington, D.C., and we got the total amount of value, and it's absolutely insane. I'll link the channel down below if you guys would like to check it out. Uh, go over to there, subscribe, watch a video if you guys want to check it Just check it out. If you guys support the channel, you guys like this one, maybe you'll enjoy that content as, uh, as well. It's a, it really is a lot of fun. Now, a few days ago, uh, the Russians, we all know, they decided they were going to do something that wasn't really out of their character. You know, they, they sent like this barrage of missiles inside of Ukraine, which... <sighs> They just did this because they lost Kirsten. They were stomping their feet and they're really mad. Now, one of these missiles was actually successfully intercepted by the Ukrainians uh, that day, and it was an X 55, which is usually the delivery system of uh, their nuclear warheads. Now, the, the price of one of these missiles is $13 million. $13 million. If you guys were wondering, like how much these Russians are actually spending to wreak havoc on the civilian population. These recent strikes really did not pan out for the Russians at all because it ended up actually moving forward a bill in the EU parliament. It started a few weeks back, but this one really kind of pushed it forward. Uh, it's going to be voted on this coming Wednesday. I think they're hosting this thing this entire week, but this thing's voted on Wednesday. Uh, they're going to be labeling uh, Russia as a state sponsor of terrorism. I'm sure this is going to go through without any issues. And it'll essentially, I, th I, I think it'll essentially isolate Russia uh, kind of like North Korea has been. So that's pretty bad if you're Russian. Like the irony here is they tried to literally bully another country and take the land that wasn't theirs, but ended up making their entire country less free and isolated their civilian population from the rest of the planet. Like that's, it's, it's, and, and now, you know, we, they actually might get to a point where it's actually going to be in favor for them. Cause now they're going to be like, all right, so if they're going to isolate us, we have nothing to lose. You know, winter has also came. If you guys didn't know. Winter is now came. It's actually came here in Texas as well. The mobilized men are really now understanding how loving and devoted the beloved motherland uh, really is for their well-being. Лейтенант, я тебе отвечаю, что он сейчас скажет находиться всем здесь, блядь, сто процентов, блядь. Оружие не получаем, парень, то по ушку не уедет. And once again we are seeing why so many uh, mo mo mobilized men are, are, are showing their lack of discipline. I guess why, 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 why it's so critical inside a military environment. Why a few episodes ago I was harping on this as being one of the major factors that is missing from the Russian military as a whole. Следующая палатка, печки все сломаны, срача не мере, все разломано, все кровати сломаны, воняет мочой. Печек вообще нету на всю палатку. Ладно, печка сломанная. Все дыры, все в дырах. Непонятно, что происходило, кто здесь спал. А напомню, на улице сегодня минус 25 градусов. Видно на печь. На палатках вон вся изморость, вся влага замерзла. Вся палатка промерзшая. Здесь никаких условий нет щитов нет голая земля it's really hard for me to also fathom how this is even a thing that is going on within the ranks of a military like an actual military I don't care if it's like a forced voluntold like rank like you know what i mean like this is what this is lack of discipline inside of all the ranks throughout the, the the russian environment leads to this and it's terrible that is not something you should be seeing inside of an organized 
military. Now, matter of fact, the Russian colonel who was actually in charge of the, the, the mobilization, one of them. Now, he wasn't really in charge of the entire thing, but one of the, the guys was putting, putting it on. He actually, he actually committed suicide inside of his office where apparently he shot himself five times with his service pistol. I don't know if he like started off by shooting himself in the foot or his leg, but somehow he committed suicide, and over the same time he committed suicide, he shot himself five times. So I don't really know how that happens, but it did. Do you guys know what the fastest growing crime in America is? It's actually identity theft, and there's a new victim every 14 seconds. I myself have had this problem. Yes, this happened to me. Years ago, I even was put on Malaysian Airlines website when that airplane went down. I was on the homepage of their website for almost 24 hours. I had so many Malaysian uh, news networks hitting me. It was it was really, it wasn't good. It wasn't good. So that's why today's sponsor of this video is Aura. Aura is identity theft protection, fraud monitoring, a VPN, password management, and antivirus software all combined into one easy to use app. You might have one of these services already, but if you do not have all the tools that is like locking the front door, but leaving the back door wide open, imagine trying to log into your email account one day only to see the password has been changed hours ago. And then you start to getting notifications, of all activity across your bank, your credit cards, crypto accounts, YouTube. That's happened to me. It's been terrible. They posted a bunch of 18 plus X rated stuff on my account for like five days straight. That happened. But guess what? If I had Aura, this probably wouldn't have happened to me. But anyway, Aura monitors the dark web for your emails, passwords, and social security numbers, and sends alerts fast right to your phone and email. Look at this. I'm showing you guys on screen right now. Look how many times my passwords have been found on the dark web. Look at this. Look at that. That is insane. Is it not? Look, that's almost disgusting to think about it. My God. It just keeps going. Aura also gives you near real-time alerts on suspicious credit inquiries. Like if someone was opening up a loan or a line of credit or a credit card inside of your name, they will alert you. Aura VPN allows you to stay anonymous online by keeping your browsing history and personal information safe and encrypted. And their antivirus software that will uh, actually block malware and viruses before they infect your device. Protect your family and yourself from identity theft at Aura.com forward slash speak the truth. And if you sign up right now, Aura will give you a two-week free trial with my link at the very top of the description so yourself and your family and your friends tell them about this. Show them how many times that you will find yourself and your family members' personal data on the web. Click the link at the very top of the description and get a two-week free trial. Why do you want to do it? Why wouldn't you want to do it? It's free. Go check it out. See how many times your information is all over the web. It's going to make you feel real uncomfortable, real unpleasant. But go check them out. They'll be linked at the very top of the description. Thank you so much to Aura for sponsoring today's episode. Now we actually get to have some verified Google reviews from a Russian soldier on how well the HIMARS actually work when fired on targets that have minimal armor and are extremely vital on the battlefield. Это силище. Прямо защищен весь, как будто. Давай, мы сейчас нахуй. Короче, попрошивало все, что можно было на. Гал, какие дыры, нахуй, ебаться можно. Турбина вся защищена, вон в чугунных этих дырах. Это пиздец какой-то. Восстанавливать. Вы гоните, тут восстанавливать нечем. Поддон. Тут пиздец. Вот это. А. Смотрите, нахуй. Нахуй. все двери, вот они, все. Как будто я нахуй, по нему кто-то солдат с ружей стрелял, скажите, че. Вот, смотрите, это Тут просто не Это Вот он этот американский хаммер что делает ряженный шариками остальными. Вот такого прячется. Кузов он с обоих сторон на вылет насквозь весь. Это Какая броня поможет после такого заряда? Просто полный пиздец. Now I could be incorrect, but I, I do believe that the type of round that was utilized here was was one that was solely used for like light armor and or vehicles 
or personnel, I guess you say. It's like a flechette round in a sense. I think it has roughly about 200,000 tungsten steel-sized BBs in it that act almost like a, a massive flechette round. If you guys don't know what a flechette round is, I guess the best way to put it is, I've only shot one one time, and it wasn't at anybody. It was at like a, a dirt wall to see what it was like because we had a whole bunch of extra ones. And I shot it, and it's like a bunch of tiny, tiny, tiny razor blades with some type of coating on it that doesn't allow your blood to coagulate, and it's actually used for crowd control. And instead of like killing a bunch of people with an explosive round, you're shooting a bunch of razor blades out, essentially. It's very, it's, I guess it's the best way to put it. Like little tiny needle type things. I, I, I think that's the best way to put it, I guess. But this one's like little tiny steel tungsten balls. It, it's used for, um, well, exactly what I just said. So these things take literally anything out that it touches. And you guys can clearly see it's going to penetrate through engine blocks, which is pretty critical. And if you're wondering what one of these rounds looks like going off and penetrating through steel, well, this video you guys are currently seeing is of that thing actually going on. And the frame rate's been slowed down so you guys can actually see the tungsten balls cutting through steel like butter. And we also have visual confirmation about a week ago that the Russians were starting to prepare the area outside of Mariupol in hopes to slow down whatever effort the Ukrainians are going to be bringing uh, them at a later date. It's going to happen at some point, which I, I do think that is going to happen, um, or they wouldn't have started it. They also think so. Now, they started to build these very large fortifications on the northern side of Crimea now, which isn't something we've seen in the past. Now, this is the most effort we have seen from the Russians to make sure that they're not going to lose an area. They're going to hold the area or give them the ability to hold an area is a better way to put it. Now, I know the, the men on the left side of the river, uh, which is going to be, remember, the flow of the river is going down. The left side is going to be the Russian side, right? It's the Ukrainians. It's been brutal for them the past few days when it comes to weather and constant shelling by the Ukraine. It's been pretty, pretty rough. So the Russians and the northern portion of the country are having to create some type of fortifications to fend off the Ukrainians. Uh, that is, the Russian propaganda outlets are still pushing this, at least this crazy narrative, that they will not stop until they reach Kiev. Никого не надо освобождать. Там надо забрать свое и сделать так, чтобы они даже думать боялись дышать плохо в сторону России. Вот и все. А что ты имеешь в виду, вот забрать свое? А где вот заканчивает свое, а где не свое? Киев, как минимум, да, он ни в коем случае не должен им остаться. А дальше посмотрим, насколько мы им устроим красивую жизнь и насколько они захотят опять в очередной раз пересмотреть. So clearly the chances of Russians actually being able to take Kiev is almost non-existent at this point in its current state. So I am not really too worried or disturbed or anything like that to see this happening. It's not going to happen, but the disturbing piece is is to see the ideolo the, the ideology oh, wow that's a tough word i ideolo idol wow right and i'm struggling with that one ideology ideology oh <laughs> that word that i'm trying to say <laughs> i cannot say this morning i'm very sorry they're just they're just struggling where the ukrainians are are really meant to be considered as as actual human beings to them they're going to take uh, what they want and, and that's what they're saying to them directly. And honestly, I do think they're hoping the West will actually get tired of the war and the motivation to help the Ukrainians will fizzle out over time, which could be true depending on who is inside of office here in America. I think they, I think it could be a thing. But I can assure you the Ukrainians have the same mindset of this, this gentleman who, who wants to make it known that they will be fighting till the end with slingshots and pitchforks if they have to. Вот сегодня в экономисте была очень такая программная статья. 
три сценария на 23 год. Россия собирается, Запад уменьшает поставки вооружения Украине, Россия собирается силами очень плохо, они несут громадные потери на перелам в отход войны в свою сторону. Один сценарий, второй сценарий тупик, стационар, и опять же Запад подталкивает переговорам. И третий, мы откуда ни возьмись, собираемся силами, вламываем, очищаем, ну и тогда переговоры по факту завершения войны. Так вот я обещаю третий вариант. Не, не примет наше общество, и не будет никакого стационара, и не будет никакого поражения от России. Это совершенно понятно и определенно. Рогатками, палками-копалками, камнями, я не знаю чем, граблями, вилами, но мы будем воевать. Без света, без воды, без еды, без ничего. Мы будем жрать корни, землю, но мы будем воевать, пока не добьем последнего гада и не выкинем с нашей земли. Не будет вооружения, перейдем к партизанской форме войны. Не будут бить партизан, значит, будем еще диверсионно действовать. Вот так это. Убьют всех, значит, трава поднимется и задушит последнего, зак... последнего захватчика. So established titles is a fun and novel way to preserve the natural woodlands of Scotland while helping global reforestation efforts. It is a project based on historic Scottish custom where landowners are referred to as lairds, lords, and ladies in English. This title pack right here gives you at least one square foot of dedicated land with a unique plot number on private estate in Edelson, Scotland, and an official certificate like this one right here with a beautiful crest on it. Yes, I am known as Lord Robert Turkla. They plant a tree with every single order and work with global charities, one tree planted, and trees for the future to support the global reforestation effort. You guys could officially include the title of Lord and or Lady on your credit card, plane tickets, dating profiles, and like it makes for an amazing last minute gift. If you guys are looking for a great gift, this is one right here. I would love to open this up on Christmas and be like, hey, I got you a plot of land over there in Edelston, Scotland. Hey, you're now a lord. I'm like, God, that is awesome. You are a great friend. The first 200 people also that purchase one of these title packs using my link will effectively be right next to me. Just a couple walking paces away and we can build our own little speak the truth kingdom. So make sure to go to establishedtitles.com forward slash truth to get your gifts right now. And hey, make sure to use the truth code at checkout to save an additional 10%. They're running a massive early Black Friday sale right now. Plus, like I said, if you guys use the code truth at checkout, you guys get an additional 10% off. So go to establishedtitles.com forward slash truth to get your gifts now and help support this channel. It'll be linked at the very top of the description. Now the last piece we're going to discuss before moving on to what is happening on the ground inside of Ukraine is something we actually spoke about earlier inside this episode and it's regard to rockets. Now the justification is being pushed to the Russian people that uh, why this didn't happen and why it's, it's, they're, they're trying to justify it. We are going to take the Ukraine. Look, it то есть вся территория Украины под ударом. При этом мы бьем, а что новенького, мы бьем не только по а, всяким подстанциям, там, а, ТЭЦ там, и так далее, и так далее. Мы начали бить еще и по газовой инфраструктуре, насколько я понимаю. Да, это, я это уже очевидно, что это, это линия. Это линия, там понятно, к чему она может привести Украину. Удары возмездия, именно удары возмездия, именно вот такой проявление нашей ненависти, абсолютно святой ненависти, они будут сидеть и без газа, и без света, и без всего. Потому что если киевский режим выбрал для себя путь военных преступников, военных преступников, они должны там и замерзнуть, и сгнить. В этом формате. Обычные люди должны сгнить ну, и мерзнуть. Обычные люди должны выйти на улицы и наконец-то закончить эту, а э, это, это правление нацистского режима. Now I can tell you guys right now, I will never understand how the Russians, after everything they've done to the Ukrainian civilian population over the last eight months or so, are, are still trying to push this narrative that they are in fact war criminals. Not, not the Russians are war criminals, but the Ukrainians are. It doesn't make any sense. Like these, these bad people and the regimes are the full Nazi scum that need to be removed from the earth. That is literally what they're pushing. It doesn't make any sense to me. Jim Zelensky. I'm going to stay on him and I'll be back on the slide. He's туда в газовой печи, не восстания нет никакого. Казалось бы, все, надо восстание. Поддавлены по большому счету. Но это синдром жертвы. Бунты где тогда, Владимир Николаевич? Не видим бунтов. Более того, говорят, что рейтинги этого товарища в маечке, если верить, по крайней мере, киевским опросам, во время военного конфликта не верьте никакой социологии. Я mm. вас умоляю. Мы должны говорить, кто виновник этого, а не так все списывать на Россию. Россия вынуждена сегодня принимать меры, потому что вот эту недельку что-то происходит, что нет, говорит об одном. 
какие-то попытки переговоров. Видите, Запад уже начал помягче. То есть вы склоняетесь к тому, что наши удары это все-таки принуждение к миру, да? Да, переговоры. А вот результат переговоров может быть разный. А почему не ударили по Херсону, когда туда приезжал Зеленский и там бродил? Знаете, есть общее правило, и я, вероятно, думаю, надо адресовать высоким, так сказать, руководителям, где президент это президент, это надо адресовать. Не, ну такие удары просто в тот самый момент, может быть, они дали бы тот эффект, мы же про понимаем, что такое решение не принимает сержант. Да? Ага. А мы ведем разговор о том, что если бы такое решение было оформлено, что террористами надо не государство объявлять, а организации людей. Вот Зеленский попадает по все признаки террориста. Его, помните, сравнение с Аль-Каидой, Бен Ладеном. Now this is the kind of stuff that really makes me just contemplate life entirely. I personally struggle trying to comprehend where this claim would even be valid. Calling Zelensky a terrorist, it makes absolutely no sense. Like, I don't even know where this claim would be made by a Russian, honestly. Like, to be honest with you guys. For God's sakes, we just spoke about the fact that Russia is now being seen as a terrorist state by the EU parliament, which is just a statement that makes, that actually makes sense. А что касается наших ударов, удары должны продолжаться. Я не, не, я не знаю, должны ли они продолжаться каждый день или нет, но по инфраструктуре удары надо наносить. И список инфраструктурных объектов обязательно нужно расширить. Потому что так или иначе это работает на нашу победу. А победа нам просто необходима. Потому что все переговоры, которые вдруг, если вдруг они начнутся с этой вот самой украинской стороной, эти переговоры ничем хорошим для нас не закончатся. Потому что с той стороны нет ни одного человека, которому российское государство и российский народ мог бы вообще в принципе поверить. Потому что они изначально существуют только для того, чтобы уничтожить наше с вами государство. И они об этом говорят открыто. И поэтому только силой можно переломить эту ситуацию. Все. And if they, they, they want to be very generous with this big motivational speech given to his own people to let them know that defeat cannot happen inside of Ukraine and the West is coming for Russia. They cannot accept any negotiations because negotiations for Russia will be bad for Russia, which is true because they will end up paying everything till like, till the end of time, pretty much, to fix Ukraine and all the destruction they've caused. I mean, think about it for a minute. Just one minute. The amount of time and money that it's going to take to rebuild the entire country, and it's going to come out of the Russians' pocket if they cannot win inside of Ukraine. Not only that, if they don't win, then they're losers to the eyes of the civilian population, which I saw some stuff uh, as well that the Wagner, the guy who owns Wagner, is also a businessman, clearly, but he might be trying to take the new role of Putin or whatnot, which I guess he would fit, he'd be very fitting. It'd be very fitting. So we're going to move over to some mapping here. We're on the, the northern side of the country. We're going to be starting over there at least. What you guys are looking at here is actually Bakhmut area. Uh, there, there hasn't been a lot of movement when it comes to uh, just north of here, uh, outside of Siv Sivitov. I'm not entirely sure if it's because of weather or maybe it's like a combination of, of weather, which I think is going to be one. But maybe the, the Russians are putting up a stiff resistance. I think that's actually... Both of the both things that's actually happened. I think that's slowing down the Ukrainians moving and because they only can utilize that one route that leads in there, which is heavily defended by the Russians. Now, I, I do think it's very critical that the Ukrainians continue to push during these months not to allow the Russians to gain any advantage whatsoever, regain that morale. Oh, we have a chance to actually win this. They need to keep pounding them as best as they possibly can. On the eastern side of the country, which we're looking at right now, I'm going to tell you guys right now, it's extremely, the fighting has picked up like pretty significantly. And it's looking somewhat bleak inside certain areas right now, outside of Bakhmut, that is. I believe one of them is just on the north, I'm going to say the northeastern side and the eastern side. That's like the two areas right now that are looking kind of grim. Okay, now I know the Russians sustained heavy casualties during one firefight where they attempted to push towards the city itself, got caught in an open area, not, not entirely an open area, but an area where the Ukrainians had good defensive perimeters set up with interlocking sectors of fire. Like, it was a meat grinder, apparently. So, we're talking interlocking sectors of fire like this, okay? Where there's absolutely no way. Now, the Russians sustained roughly 100 casualties inside this one instance, and they managed to get a platoon-sized element across the Bakhmutu River, okay? But they're not going to get very far because they didn't pre-plan this, and now they're somewhat trapped, okay? Let's imagine the amount of chaos that's going on. They got pushed across. They got across. Now, the Ukrainians on the high ground... They got to deal with this interlocking sector of fire area right there. They're in a bad spot. The Ukrainians actually control the high ground so much inside this area where it's going to be very unlikely that the Russians actually advance forward from here. I think it's going to be very brutal. I don't. I, don't, I wouldn't want to be there. It's going to throw that out there. So I'm going to shift a little south out of here. That's pretty much what's gone um, along, pretty much. So we're going down here towards Avika, Piski, 
Olhein, which this is one of the areas that was actually just taken um, by the Russians now. They actually, or excuse me, Optine. I said Olhein. It's a different area. So Optine itself is now controlled by the Russians, which I know I told you guys in the previous episode and one before that, they took the southern, southwestern side of the, the city, but now they control the entire thing. But the Ukrainian military was also forced to retreat out of the eastern part of a town of Permosky, okay, which is west of here. Okay, due to Russian artillery destroying every single building inside this area. So that's roughly, just so you guys are aware, along this main E-50 route about right there. Not a very big town, not a very small, it's kind of like a medium-sized. Now, I don't know, this this area is pretty crucial for the, the Russian logistical supplies to get all the way from here to Kyrgyzstan area because the Russians are, their supply routes are being targeted once again, which we're going to shift. Oh, well, I'm just going to go shift over to Kyrgyzstan. I'm going to tell you guys right now, there's been no change on the front, but the Russians have been hit deep behind their lines inside of Melitopol. The Ukrainians have targeted the 58th Combined Army, or Arms Army, excuse me, which was located inside the city itself, and the Russians sustained almost 100 casualties during that strike alone. The Ukrainians also destroyed another S-300 surface-to-air missile site outside of Kyrgyzstan. That's like the only major thing that's really gone on since they took that one side, which I would assume we all knew was going to slow down in that area. But now the Ukrainians are targeting the train routes that are leading to the southern side of Ukraine. And this is just a continuation of their previous efforts, which were very successful in slowing down uh, the Russian efforts in Kyrgyzstan by targeting those supplier routes, which led to the fall of the Russian occupation of this area. So if they are successful in taking out the Russians' train routes, this will effectively force the Russians to utilize trucks for transportation, which they do not want to do, and their sea fleet, which we know how that's been so far. So that's pretty much it for the mapping. Thanks for hanging out with me, guys. I do enjoy every time you guys decide to spend your time with me because I know it's very valid and valuable. So I love you guys. I am out.